Hello there, I'm Oliver Cummings, CEO of Neural, and today I'm delighted to be introducing you to a lifer at Microsoft. Neil has spent his 27-year career at Microsoft, latterly as Vice President Amir for the Consumer and Device Sales team. He was recently appointed through Neural to his first independent director role on the board of Barris, a market-leading brand builder, which either owns or has the exclusive UK rights to over 30 global brands that span the marine, industrial, and gardening markets. He's also served as a member of the UK IE board of directors, the UK games industry body. He was a member of Microsoft UK's board, as well as Microsoft's EMEA board, and a member of Microsoft's global consumer device sales board. Neil has broad experience in launching and driving innovations from a product perspective, as well as new innovations and business model changes required to meet the new demands of customers and market dynamics. Neil, it's great to have you on board. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Great to be with you, Oliver. So I'd like to start, uh, Neil. Obviously, you, you have experienced an extraordinarily successful journey at Microsoft during your three decades there. Can you talk me through your experience of that? Well, I suppose it was a bit of an accident to begin with. It was a very fortunate accident for me. I left university and, and joined a sort of company that was in the travel business, really. They owned ceiling ferries and various other businesses. And after doing a graduate traineeship with them, after about three years, I decided that I wanted to move into a, a slightly higher paced environment that was really looking to the future. And I just came across this, what was then a relatively small company called Microsoft. Didn't understand completely what they did, if I'm in all honesty. I just about started using computers, but I thought, well, it'll be interesting to go and have a chat with them. I went and had a chat with them. I think my interview lasted 40 minutes. I was offered a job there and then. And I joined the UK team, which I think the UK company at the time was about 100 people, 120 people. I joined that team. Uh, really, as a consumer marketing person, that was why they they wanted me. They wanted someone to come in and help explain technology in consumer terms to customers. And in many ways, that's been my USP, I suppose, in Microsoft for the last 30 years. I spent a lot of my time selling technology into the consumer space and trying to explain the benefits of that technology rather than the technology itself. And it's been an amazing journey. You know, I've, I've been very lucky. I joined what's been an amazing company that's seen fantastic growth. It's diversified and changed enormously over the time that I was there and is still changing and diversifying today. And it's been a, a super journey where I've been able to basically join a lot of startups within a big company. So I've had a lot of, if you like, starting business experiences, which I'm sure we'll talk about as well as trying to maintain scale businesses that have a lot of mechanics to them. So it's, it's been a fascinating journey, and I, I loved every minute of it. And what do you think it was that the board sort of got right? What was your experience and connection to the board through that journey, and how did they manage to keep that innovation going? Well, obviously, my experience of, of the board kind of changed through time. As I became more senior in the company, I got a little bit closer to what some of those decisions and motivations for the decisions were. But I think the one thing that was common when Bill started the company is he had a very clear vision of where he wanted to take the company. And I think that that's always been really important to Microsoft is it's got real clarity on where it wants to go and why it wants to go there. And I think that has persisted from Bill Gates's time through Steve Barmer and to now Satya. And I think that clarity of purpose and vision has been critical, really. And then underpinning that, they've been able to really understand how to land clear milestones on that journey and what it took and where it took to win in order to achieve some of the visions and, and the growth that they wanted to get. So clarity of communication, clarity of vision has been super important through that journey. And then framing all of that in what, what was an occasion, quite a rigorous discipline on the data, the numeracies within the business, understanding what was happening in markets through what data was telling us. And it was, it's be, always been quite a data-driven company. And I think for me, I thrived on that. I love 
picturing the world in the forms of data trends. It, it helps me understand what's happening. And I think that's been a big success for how Microsoft has managed its way through its various challenges. And I think the last thing is it's always been ambitious to take intelligent risks. And that's the way I've always described it, that be it Windows, be it the browser wars, be it moving to the cloud, Microsoft's always understood that it needs to take risk to change its business model, to change its focus in order to kind of reap the curve of, ne- of the next growth wave. And it's had the ambition and the willingness to take those risks. But most of those risks are born on intelligence. There's a few things we did that maybe didn't work out. You know, the Nokia acquisition was maybe not the the best risk in hindsight. They've always been prepared to step into some of those places because they believe they could make a difference. And I think that that ability to leap into those places, take that risk based on intelligence has served them very well over the certainly the 30 years that I was there, nearly 30 years. Got it. And, And you talked at the start there about purpose. And we see lots of boards wrestling with that, what does it mean? Unilever got challenged on, you know, does does Hellman's mayonnaise need purpose? What was that purpose for Microsoft and why do you think it was effective? Well, I think to begin with, when I joined, you know, Bill's well-drafted vision was a PC on every desk and in every home. So he had a vision of democratizing technology. And so when you joined Microsoft, you were joining a company that wanted to bring technology to everybody because of the power that that technology could have. And that was a a binding vision, certainly when I first started, that really kind of galvanized what we were doing and why we were trying to do it and how we applied it to all of the elements that we then went after and all the different applications that we built and, and marketed, et cetera. You know, it's moved now into kind of realizing every organization and person's potential. And you could argue that those statements are quite broad in some ways, and they're not very specific. But I think what they do is they give people a sense of meaning of direction. And then what underpins that are then some of the milestones and key targets that you then want to get to that deliver on that vision, purpose, whatever set of words you want to use to describe it. And I just think that helps a whole organization move in a very similar direction. And then everyone has to find their place as to how they're building up to that piece. And I think with boards, and my experience on on various boards, is when they don't have some clarity of what that purpose is and where they want to get to, whatever, however they want to frame it in the set of words, it just leads to a, a slight lack of clarity at the top. And a slight lack of clarity at the top leads to much wider lack of clarity throughout an organization. What's extraordinary there is that when you first came in, you felt that sense of purpose. And it sounds like the board managed to get have that running through the whole organization. How did they manage to do that so effectively? It's a combination of people understanding what the vision and the direction that the leadership wanted to take was. And they did that through various techniques, through summits, through, through various communication techniques. But then what Microsoft was, I thought was very good, some other people got challenged by it, is it ran a fairly rigorous methodology of understanding what are the key measures that tell us we're on the journey? How are we building methods to check our progress against some of those milestones? And how are we all being held accountable to deliver on those pieces, irrespective of where you are geographically or discipline-wise within the company? So the combination of giving the clarity of explanation of where we're going and then having the building blocks of measures and milestones and accountability, I think, helped everyone maintain focus. And so it wasn't just a broad statement that was made and then everyone went off and did whatever they want that they thought was appropriate to get there. It was relatively disciplined in its approach. Now, in the early days, that was combined with quite a high level of entrepreneurial spirit kind of throughout the world. Every country and every region was trying to figure out its own journey on on that PC on every desk and in every home because technology adoption at the PC level was still fairly nascent. And so different countries were pursuing that at different rates. But you were all working within a very similar framework. And I think that clarity 
of framework. And I think Sean Covey, Stephen Covey's son, co-authored a book, The Four Principles of the Four Disciplines of Effective Execution. And, And he talks quite nicely in that about this process of clarity of understanding what's important, setting clear metrics and holding people to those accountability measures quite nicely. And I think Microsoft did that from a very early stage, in my experience, that I was part of it. And we used to have something called mid-year review, which our financial year went from July the 1st to June the 30th. And in January, Bill and Steve, when I first joined, used to kind of go around the world and basically take every country through a deep dive on its business according to this set view of life. And it was, I don't know, something approaching, you know, 70 or 80 pages of data. And you used to talk about the business in that way. And it was taxing, very taxing for people involved. But the one thing it did is it ensured everyone understood the direction and everyone understood what success looked like. They've kind of more recently moved away from that approach. But in the early days, I think it really helped an exploding company like Microsoft keep some management control of where everyone was going. One of the things we often see organizations and boards wrestling with is exactly what those metrics are. And some organizations focus too much on the output metrics and looking backwards. Some, a lot of the best organizations seem to have more of a focus on the input metrics, the things that they can shift. When you're trying to pursue a vision like democratizing technology, a PC in every home, can you talk more about what those metrics look like? Well, back in those days, a lot of it was about penetration rates because, you know, you're you're trying to basically convince people and businesses to step into technology early, which always has somewhat of a cost, whether you're an individual at home or whether you're a business. And if you're an early leader in that, the cost is relatively high. So a lot of the metrics were about how well were we convincing people about the benefits they were going to reap from moving into that cost, so penetration metrics. Obviously, as the the landscape got very competitive, competitive metrics became very important. But I think we got much better at Microsoft as we matured to have more leading indicator metrics. So metrics that would not really tell us where we were, but would tell us the path that we were gliding towards. There were more predictive metrics and be that usage type metrics. So, you know, if you're you today, if you're using a service like the live service in gaming or, or the Office 365 service, a lot of it is really about usage because what usage tells you is the likelihood for people to come back and be retained on the service or whether they're going to drop out. And so we got much better, I think, at understanding what the leading metrics were versus, as you say, the output metrics of ultimate performance. And in the early days, it was it was fairly basic, I would say, because we were just growing at such a rapid rate that it was just trying to keep hold of the dragon at the time was tough. But we definitely got more precise about what the bleeding and leading metrics were and how was our story being understood. That was a key important thing, really. You know, in the certainly in the battle between Microsoft and Apple in, in the, the more latter years, where Apple, you know, a phenomenal branding company, did a great job at positioning itself in a certain way around design, the creative elite, etc. And Microsoft was seen much more as the utilitarian kind of version of computing. How we told our story and got better and better, and in some ways learning from what Apple were doing to tell our story became very important metrics in us understanding how we were going to drive growth for the future, because we needed to drive more belief and more passion, really, around what the brand was offering through its products. So, you know, fascinating journey. I think we kept learning. Microsoft is probably still learning a lot about how to do that. But certainly, it was very concentrated on output metrics, but we did move much more to kind of more of the input trending type data feeds that would help us understand stuff. And you mentioned there that the process has evolved it sounds like it sort of was no longer sort of fit for purpose. What were the changes and why did those come about? Well, the changes were that some of it was leadership. So as some of the leadership changed in the organization, some of their philosophy about how to drive performance changed. So leadership plays a key role in any 
you know, if you have strong individual leaders at the CEO level, the COO level, CFO level, they can have a big impact on the culture and, and focus. And certainly as we changed people in those roles, you can see the culture move within the company. I think I've seen that in a number of organizations that I either worked in or been aligned to. So that's one big piece of what creates change. I think the other thing in Microsoft is probably in more in the last 10 years, its confidence in its organization to be doing the right thing has probably grown, is the best way I can describe it. So whereas in my first 20 years, there was a fair bit of oversight to ensure the organization was all moving in the right direction to, to a one purpose, one voice. I think under Satya's leadership, it's become more trusting in what different elements of the organization need to do and that they are in line step with the direction. And there needs to be slightly less oversight at the detail level. And therefore, they've relaxed, I think, some of that in the more recent years. And as a company becomes deeply complicated, and Microsoft is a deeply complicated organization in, in many big businesses, it's a conglomeration of a number of really large businesses, you need to give those businesses some air within themselves sometimes. And I think that's what's happened in the sort of more of the last 10 years than perhaps happened in my first 15, 20 years. You know, you were involved both at the regional and national at a board level. Can you talk about the dynamic there of, of how those boards interacted with a so group level board and, and the different roles they played? Well, starting at the national, you know, the national boards are there to obviously ensure that they meet the performance targets that the company needs to acquire in that, in that country, but really to also understand how does the company, in my case, Microsoft, make an impact in that country above and beyond its business. It has a social responsibility impact. It has a responsibility to all of its employees within that country. And so sitting on that board, a lot of my time was spent around those issues versus the business performance side of it, which is what we would deal with through our kind of line businesses up to the corporate teams. And so a lot of that was more of the traditional governance roles of boards, if you like, that, that we played. And at the regional level, it was similar. However, at the regional level, we were really trying to understand the pace at which the different countries or sub-regions were growing and how we needed to adapt strategy to look at different national environments in different ways. So when I was running Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and say I was running the Xbox business, there's a very different approach you take to Xbox, even within Western Europe and in countries within Western Europe than you would in the Middle East and certainly in Africa. And so a lot of the regional board's work is really understanding that texture and nuance that needs to be created through the business and then how do you bring your different organizations through to the same goal, but at different speeds and rates, and still with a lot of the, the governance elements kind of intertwined? That's fascinating. I mean, I, re I remember we, we used to have investments in quite a few international businesses, and there were a few examples that, that stood out for me. I remember there was one uh, we were invested in the makers of Big Brother. And it's fascinating because in certain parts of the world, you had to have people being voted in. And in other parts of the world, you had to have people being voted out because it was complete. Yes. You know, one, it didn't work in one versus the other. What, what were those sorts of cultural phenomenons that you observed through that Xbox experience? Well, Xbox is fascinating. The games industry is fascinating. The way people play games, the platforms on which people want to play games, the types of game people want to play differs enormously as you travel around the world. And so with things like Xbox, you have the issue of income. So what countries can afford the ecosystem of a video games console system that makes sense for consumers in that country, but will also make sense for your business? Because in a lot of the console business, you're losing a lot of money on hardware and you're having to make it up on software services and accessories. And that can be a fine balance, especially when you first launch a console. And so understanding economically the opportunities that exist is kind of step number one. 
And then step number two is really understanding games are the engine of the games industry, no surprise. But different parts of Europe, the Middle East, will veer towards different genres of titles. So certain titles that you launch that might be your, your AAA, it might do really well in Northern Europe and the UK, but will do proportionately less well in Southern Europe that are more socially driven and sports driven. So all of those nuances in your business really help you define how your investment strategy needs to look and shape and what's the different paces at which you want to drive your business through those regions and those countries. And part of the challenge as a board member is if you've got something like Xbox in a company like Microsoft, where everyone believes everything is possible, you'll have a number of countries that will say to you, oh, we've got an amazing opportunity for Xbox. It can be fantastic. It'll be brilliant because, you know, those people are very keen to get involved and want to and want to do the game. But I think it was uh, Sun Zhu in The Art of War paraphrasing, said something like along the lines of great leaders know when to say no. They know when to go into battle and they know when not to go into battle. And, you know, a lot of my job at the time when I was running the Xbox business was saying no to a lot of countries, a lot of governments, a lot of consumers that were all angry that we wouldn't participate in their markets. But for pretty sound financial reasons, it kind of didn't always make sense. And we didn't have necessarily the right infrastructure to do a good enough job. So you learn those things when you're dealing across multiple countries and you learn one size doesn't always fit all. In some instances, I think people will always try to create a difference when there isn't. Sometimes human beings are human beings in certain senses. But then there are real differences that you do have to take account of and be sensible in the way that you approach certain businesses. What were the things that you got wrong? I mean, so many of the boards that, that are using the Neural platform are looking to expand internationally. And, you know, as an investor, I've seen so many organizations get that wrong. They spread themselves too thinly. They fail to understand the local sort of dynamics. What, what are the things that you got wrong? In some senses, we didn't always understand what a product solution really looked like in a market. So if I take the gaming business, a product solution is I need to sell a console, I need to sell games. I really need to put a service on that. So I need internet connections that are solid and big and broad. And I need a, an ecosystem of content that you can monetize in essence and give consumers the sort of experience they want in their local language, ideally. So often, I think we would go into countries with a very tight economic argument and we may be sacrificed consumer experience in order to just be there. And I think in hindsight, it was better to not be there until we were ready and provide the proper, correct solution rather than going with something that we felt was kind of three quarters right, but didn't really meet the expectation. Because I think it's, it's sometimes better to disappoint consumers by not giving them something than give them something that's really not good enough that then has bigger impacts on your brand, but really kind of disenfranchises them for the future. So we tended to make those mistakes. And also, we didn't always do a good enough job of explaining the real business model to the people in the countries. And this is about clarity of communication for me and, and authenticity and trust. Be it the product teams at corporate through the regional teams, people would sometimes hide some of the costs because they kind of wanted to manage and manipulate outcomes. And that lack of transparency then led to people taking actions at the country level that actually hurt the business, but they didn't realize they were doing it because they didn't have the type of transparency they needed. So as I matured in my leadership, I certainly became more and more and more transparent about as much as I possibly could. And especially when you're saying no to people, that is critical, I think. And you have to be strong in those situations. Fascinating. So I will often sort of do post-mortems, retrospectives, whenever sort of business I've been involved with have got things wrong. I think, gosh, what did I miss? What should I have asked back at the time? And I think about it, you know, when I see sort of examples, uh, look at something like Grenfell Tower, and I think, gosh, if I'd been on that board, would I have asked the questions that would have helped them 
avoid that and you know often it's just really difficult what what do you think you know with the wisdom that you've acquired now what are the questions that you would have needed to ask at the board level to have identified and foreseen those sorts of issues are they inevitable or, or do you think they could have been avoided the key questions boil down to what do we really want to achieve what's really important to us and let's lock on what's important and why so everyone has real clarity on on that and then how do we know if what we're going to do has a great chance of success what is it that's going to tell us that it has a great chance of success and just have that logic and not be overly driven by emotion and overly driven sometimes by passion in an entrepreneurial business passion is a vital aspect but sometimes it can lead you to kind of become blinded so you've just got you've got to have someone there who's just being really objective and i think on boards and this is one of the things that i'm trying to learn to get good at on boards that i sit at is how do i take the passion out of my analysis of a situation and be as objective as i possibly can and just ask objective questions and not assume too much and the further into a company you are the harder that gets because you become socialized to the norms and i think you know what a good board does is it has diversity of opinion that really does drive that objective questioning and solution stimulus if you like and attacks things from perhaps a very different angle than the traditional approach that the executives will be attacking it from and so that objectivity i think is key i for people that used to work with me at microsoft in in the earlier days i probably changed this advice slightly now but i used to say there were three things you needed to be you needed to be concise, numerate and objective. And if you were those three things, you'd go far in this company. And that's what I think you need in the boards to make sure you don't make catastrophic failures. Failures are inevitable because if you're taking business risk, which you, you should do at some level, you're going to have some failures, but to avoid catastrophic ones, you need to deploy that objectivity, I think. And you talked about sort of working on trying to learn how to take the passion out. What are the specific tools or techniques that you're exploring for that? Or how are you going about that? I think it's not being shy to question. I think it's important when you sit on a board, and I feel this, I've recently joined joined the, the Keyword Studios board, and I sit in certain committee meetings in the audit committee and stuff, and I'm learning a lot of new elements because it's a it's a listed board, so there's lots of elements being listed that are new to me and not being afraid to ask what maybe you think are dumb questions, but seek the clarity. Don't sit back and not seek the clarity. So keep asking those questions and keep pushing for people's motivation as to why they want to do something in a certain way. Why is it you want to drive to that acquisition or that particular strategy? Why is it that we're not fast enough in driving our ESG agenda? What's stopping us do that? So just keep prodding for what some of the underlying motivations are in the business, because that's the way you start to understand the culture in the business. And obviously, as you, as you go into a business as a non-exec, you're touching the surface of the culture, really, because you're not embroiled in it on a day-to-day -day basis like the, the executives are. And whether it's with Barris or with Keywords or, or other boards, trying to get a handle on what the culture is, I think, is very important because then you can understand what the really good aspects are and what are maybe some of the more limiting aspects of the culture. And it's the questioning for me that, that gives you some of that insight. And that insight is what leads to you understanding where flags may start to arise. Interesting. And can you give any examples of, of where you've sort of managed through that sort of questioning to sort of unearth stuff where you've had that kind of light bulb moment as a, as a board? I was working with one company and they were doing employee surveys to try to understand how their employees felt. And the process they basically had was they would do a survey and it would take practically a year 
from the survey being completed by the employees to something going out and something changing in the organization. And to me, that raises a flag that says, well, if you really want to listen to what your employees are telling you and you really want to act on it, that timeline is very long for me. I'm used to a timeline where you do quite in-depth work and you're, you're taking action within three months and you're taking it seriously. You've decided to get feedback. You need to take it seriously. You're taking action. And I'm a kind of an agility focus type person. I, I like action to be to be moving because I'd rather not know everything but start down the journey than know completely everything and be late. So that was a, you know, a really small little inkling for me that we need to push that particular business a little bit quicker in the way that they're actioning what they're learning. And therefore, is the culture absorbing its knowledge quick enough and acting quick enough based on the knowledge? And how can it become a bit more agile? And so it, little things like that, there are, more, there are slightly more serious things, but I won't go into those because uh, that probably wouldn't be appropriate. That's fascinating. And, and actually, I'm always surprised at how few organizations have that sort of insight into their organization and the feedback on you know, how the organization feels, the, the people analytics, often they're sort of done on a one-year basis. We actually, for our own business, you know, have weekly insights that get aggregated and then a quarterly committee that meets to implement actions out of those insights. So you get that feedback loop working. Yeah. And there's, you know, it's something I've seen relatively rarely that boards don't often have that insight. They rely a lot on the executive narrative. And actually, despite saying, gosh, people are the most important thing, they actually have very little clue of how the organization is actually doing. I think the mistake a lot of companies can fall into and at Microsoft in my time we definitely fell into this is sometimes you do you ask for feedback be it from employees be it from customers with the goal of the feedback being to fill out a scorecard and to be able to say you know in Microsoft the scorecards were kind of green amber red so you wanted to be green are you green on this scorecard if you are right I've forgotten about it rather than what have our customers told us we might be green, but what have our customers told us and what do we need to do differently? So again, another kind of instance I had recently is a company kind of said, we've, we've done customer feedback. And I don't know if they were then going to go back to those customers promptly at an individual level, because they don't have enormous amounts of customers and kind of say, great, thanks for the feedback. Here's what I heard. Here's what I heard you say. Here's what we now need to do to address issues you have or opportunities that you're raising. And it's about that proactive cultural drive that the board, I think, needs to be constantly pushing on to make sure the executives are not trying to just fill out scorecards. They're actually authentically trying to react to what their employees are telling them, the customers are telling them, their partners are telling them, whichever community of stakeholders they're particularly um, trying to learn from. You've obviously had incredible success launching into new geographic markets, but you've also had extraordinary success launching new products. And that's something, again, we see lots of the boards on new role wrestling with of when is the right time to launch a new product? Do you concentrate on, you know, stick to the knitting, do what you're good at, or, or do you diversify? Can you maybe talk through how you thought through those sorts of challenges? So Xbox, if we take that as, as our first example... I certainly wasn't the person that thought that up. That was a couple of guys in the States, one of the guys called Jay Allard, who had a vision of where Microsoft could play in the gaming sector and how software was going to be pivotal to how the gaming sector developed over time and that the gaming sector was going to be a significant opportunity for tech companies, which it obviously is and has become. But when we produced the first Xbox, it's fair to say we weren't massively successful. We built a, a product that was probably just ahead. It was a bit like the Dreamcast that came out of Sega. It was just ahead of where the market was because we decided to put an Ethernet cable in that first Xbox. Internet penetration wasn't good enough. It wasn't quick enough. And therefore, the box cost us a lot of money, which then made the economics of the business very tough. And so when we launched in Europe, uh, especially our pricing was at a level for us to not lose too much money that consumers didn't buy it at the rate we wanted them to buy it. But what Microsoft did is it learned very fast of that. It failed fast. 
And it had the commitment to say, okay, we didn't get this one quite right, but it's taught us an awful lot of lessons. Now let's get back to market quickly with a product that has those lessons inbuilt. So we came back with the Xbox 360 that was more of a modular console. So we were able to scale the pricing based on the technology people wanted to buy into. So if you were a casual gamer, you could step in at the lower end, or if you were a confirmed sort of deep gamer, you could come in at the higher end. And that ability for us to scale our cost base really helped us then grow and be successful. For me, that was a great example of us learning fast, failing fast, and moving on with commitment and zeal. One example that didn't come to market was Microsoft launched a a music player. When iPod came out, we kind of looked around and said, geez, Apple has done a very smart thing there. Let's figure out what we're going to do. And we came out with a a media player called Zoom, which North American folks may remember. It was a lovely product. And I was asked to launch that in the UK. There's a guy running the consumer division called Robbie Bach, and I was running the consumer division in the UK. And he said, sent me a mail saying, we want to launch this in the UK, build a business case for it. And so I worked pretty hard with my financial controller and we we did the math on it and I looked at it and I just couldn't find a way to make the economics of it work. Coupled with the fact I was looking at the mobile phone market at the time and saying, this is going to be taken over by phones. This, this standalone idea of a media player doesn't make sense to me, given where phones are going to be in probably 18 months' time. And so we kind of went back, and this was a big deal because Robbie's request to me wasn't, should we do it? Robbie's request to me was, tell me what it's going to take to do it. So we kind of went back and said, it's going to take an awful lot of money. And in all honesty, I really don't think this is going to pay back. And it was a tough set of conversations we had because a lot of people were invested in expanding this product range across the world. And the UK was seen as one of the easier markets to go in. But we had the hard conversations. And in the end, we decided not to do it. And we decided, no, we'd stay with North America. And over time, you know, Zoom did go away. We learned again. Microsoft learned an awful lot about streaming services and copyright and IP through that process. But it was a case of saying no was absolutely the right thing. And I'm glad we managed to do that in that case. There are other examples where we didn't say no in Microsoft and they paid a fairly hefty price. But those are some of the examples of you have to learn fast. You have to be clear on whether something really does make sense versus you emotionally would love to do it and just be as objective as you can and stick to your guns. And how do you think about the challenge of resource allocation when you're navigating sort of new product launches? Recently reading Working Backwards, which gives a lot of insight into the way Amazon think about that with self-sufficient teams so that there's not a sort of squabble over engineering resource or whatever it might be. And it's obviously worked well for them. But how did you navigate that at the board level of figuring out, do we have the resource to do this and and how do we allocate that? I think when you've got a brand new initiative or a new product that is in a new category and a new market area, I'm a firm believer in you need a discrete team and resources to do it. Don't blend it with what a lot of other people do and it's it's a kind of a, a bit of a pastime for those people. So be as discrete as you can in that build launch phase. And we certainly did that with Xbox. So one of the arm wrestles in Microsoft at the time was that the Xbox division, if you like, was kind of separated out of the mothership operationally around the world purposefully so that because it was very different than selling software licenses into corporates, it was a different beast when you needed a different set of cast of characters to take that to market with a different mentality. So I do think if you've got a new product that is quite different to what you're traditionally doing, I do think it's important to separate your cast away. I think it's important that you set out understanding what the resource is to make that a success. So if you set out with a shoestring, it's unlikely you can be successful. So you've got to really understand that you have the resources to do what you think needs to get done in order to make an impact to the level you need to make an impact to then make the next decision to invest. And I think that's really critical. 
And that's a lot of the conversations I had at, on the different boards I was sitting on at the time. This was the country decision is, do we have the resources to really launch that product effectively in that market? And if the answer was no, just having a product there didn't cut it. You had to be clear on that. That's what's really important. And then if you're in the situation where you're launching a new version of something, but you still need people to run an old version of something, that's where it gets really quite tricky because everyone wants to run to the new, <laughs> the new shiny bauble and people don't really want to be stuck in the old bauble. So you have to explain the value to each of those groups of what they're doing clearly. And they have to be valued. And certainly, as Microsoft transitioned out of certain businesses or, you know, when we went from a license-based business to a service-based business, as they do in, in most of their software today, making that transition and helping people under, understand the value that they're giving to the organization, whether they sit in Camp A or B, was really, really important. And that's what sometimes I think leaders can forget. They're so fixated on the new thing they're trying to create the kind of people that are left farming the farm feel very unloved and, uh, and don't feel as if they're being valued in the right way. And I think that's an important thing for leaders to recognize. And how, you know, if you're sitting on one of your boards and you're seeing this happening, what's your sort of challenge to the executive team or, or question to the executive team to help them think that through? I think it really is as simple as... How are we valuing what those people are doing? How are those people getting recognized and rewarded? When we maybe talk about some key talent that is pervading the organization, it depends on the size of the company as to how you talk about that. But when you talk about the key talent you have, is some of that key talent in some of those core businesses that, you know, they're not all moved to the new business. And how are you motivating them as a chief exec or as a COO? How are you motivating those people to keep that engine running efficiently? Those people-orientated questions are very important touch papers for non-execs to be prodding on when they're talking to the CEO and the FD and to make sure that the responses are authentic and deep enough and they're not just a surface level response. And I think, you know, a big part of what the board has to do above its governance roles, et cetera, et cetera, is understanding the health of the organization. Is the organization in a healthy state and in the ways that the leadership are looking at how they're managing their organizational health, does it feel authentic? Does it feel like they're really bought in to those processes and those insights or not? And I think that's how you test that type of thing. Do you just want to go on to what I sort of saw as a third string of, of, of your narrative there? Because you, not only have you been extraordinarily successful with growing new products and, and taking them into new markets, but you've also actually had success integrating and rationalizing businesses. So it hasn't just been on the growth side. Can you talk through some of your lessons on that side that, again, when you're sort of sitting on boards now, what are the things that you're looking for when an executive team tells you we need to go through a sort of rationalization, integration? What are you looking out for? What are you asking? What I'm really trying to understand or what I learned is you have to be honest with people, as transparent as you can be, because obviously transparency is hard when you're going through a rationalization process for, for legal issues, et cetera. But you need to be communicating often, be as transparent as you can possibly be, and just be as honest as you can possibly be with people, even if that means delivering quite difficult messages. And how are the leadership delivering those messages? And are they standing up to that in the right way, in an empathetic way? Because sometimes, you, you know, you do have to deliver bad news to people. That's the life of a commercial environment. You know, things change, things move. You've got to deliver those messages. And it's never easy, but you want to make sure that your leaders are really stepping into that in a people-focused way. You see these horror stories where emails get sent out or a Zoom call gets Duh, all this terrible stuff that you kind of see. What I want to know from the executive leadership is how are they doing it with 
empathy, transparency, as much honesty as they can, and as much speed as makes sense. In the transitions that I've done, once you've kind of come to the conclusion of what you need to do, you then need to get it done relatively quickly. Don't procrastinate too much. Really drive that process through because you need the organization that is going to remain to get focused and move on to what you needed to move on to. And for the people that are negatively affected, you need to help them move to what their next roles need to be potentially outside the organization, but you need to help them through. And you need good plans on both of those sides. And depending on the depth to which a leader tells me they've planned for it, gives me a really good insight as to whether I think they're dealing with it with empathy and the right level of empathy and whether they're dealing with it personally. I've seen too many leaders not deal with tough discussions personally, and I think that's exceptionally poor, and we have to watch out for that. When I've seen this happen sometimes, I think of a few occasions where I've seen organizations brought together and they they were left to effectively fight it out as a sort of dog-eat-dog. When have you seen it go wrong? There's two things that I see happen. It generally goes wrong when a leader is not clear and they delegate too much of the communication down to lower layers of leadership in the organization. They don't really take personal accountability and authority on the communication and where it's going. And secondly, people often hide behind legalese of a process. And they don't understand that although you need to follow various legal processes in in a rationalization exercise, which if you're working internationally can be super complicated because labor laws in different countries differ enormously, what you've got to not do is let that legal process stop the communication process. And I've seen people get tied up with trying to do absolutely the right thing legally, but in the process, they've become mute because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing because of the legal landscape. And, you know, I think no matter what sort of legal process you're following, you should always keep communication channels open. And where I've seen it fail is when people are not doing that. They just go quiet for too long a period. And, you know, a week is too long a period often in these processes, even though the process might have to take 12, 16 weeks, even longer if you're in Germany or France, you still need to be communicating regularly, even if it's just to say, if anyone wants to come and chat to me, please come and chat to me and I'll tell you whatever I can or hear whatever it is you have to say. And so those are the things that I think usually break down. And it generally just shows a lack of leadership competence in my in my experience. And Brene Brown, I quite like some of the things she says she has to say around dare to lead and showing vulnerability and emotion doing those processes is also important. You don't obviously want to break down in front of people, but you do want to show empathy and emotion. But you do have to be prepared to have some of those difficult conversations as a leader. And I think that's really important for leaders to kind of internalize. What do you think board members can do in those situations? Because in my experience, often, you know, the boards will make the decision and then move on, and then they're then focused elsewhere. So what, what do you think boards should be doing there? I think a key part of what a board should do in those situations is, one, understand the executive team has a good plan for what, how they're going to manage the process, and then secondly, support that executive team because they will be going through a tough process themselves as individuals. So I think it's it's twofold. You know, is the plan there? Have they thought about the approach they're going to take in the right way? And do they have a, an execution plan that, that feels right? And then secondly, what support do they need as individuals from the rest of the board as they go through that process? Because, you know, you could have an executive team that have maybe never been through that before and just – want to chat through different scenarios that they're facing and want someone who's been through that a number of times to kind of share some insights. So I think I think a board needs to play that supporting role as well for its executive team. You touched earlier on the importance of having that cognitive diversity in order to maintain the freshness of input that's coming to the board. 
How do you think about getting the right mix of, of sort of talent and experience on boards? And what, what have you seen work best? Uh, I imagine within an organization like Microsoft, you, you're always trying to balance I mean, the, those who've got all the experience and those coming in with the new innovative ideas. What do you think is the right way to think about that? Balance? I do think that a board, a chairman especially, does need to constantly look at its board makeup and say, do I have a really good, diverse set of experiences around the table? We're all at influence of hiring people are very similar to ourselves. And that bias is, is there, that unconscious bias is there in, in, in many ways. So trying to be objective about looking at the skill sets of the people you've got sitting around the table, I think is really key. And certainly in Microsoft, we didn't always get that right. We kind of brought people that we felt comfortable with in terms of we knew kind of what their experience was, we knew what their performance levels were, therefore they were a safe choice. Sometimes you've got to place a little a bet on on people that maybe are going to come from things from, from quite a different angle to what a number of the other board members will have, just so you've got that challenge and those different perspectives coming into the mix. And I do think that's important. So Certainly when I joined the Barris board, I knew nothing about the businesses they were in. I know nothing about marine engines. I know nothing about garden tools and equipment or electric UTV vehicles or any of that. But I think what they were looking for was someone to give them an objective voice on how to grow a business, how to run a business effectively, which hopefully I can help them with. And so I think it is about that diversity of opinion and taking some risk on a few appointments of people that will come a little left field from the traditional areas that you might want to take your board makeup from. And in your Microsoft experience, was there any particular framework that you use to think about that composition? I mean, some people talk about mindsets or conflict styles or, you know, beyond just simply sort of, you know, functional expertise or geographic or industry expertise. I'd love to say we, we did, Oliver. I'd love to say we did, but I'm not sure we, we did in reality. I think we looked for competence in skill sets because most of the boards I was sort of sitting with or on were kind of leaders of different types of businesses and they needed a certain skill set, a certain discipline set within those businesses. We certainly looked for people that were able to demonstrate agility in the different types of experiences they'd had. That was, I think, the way that we tended to look at potential in people and how we wanted to bring in new energy to the board. So someone who had quite a variety of different types of experiences, not necessarily different companies, but certainly different types of roles that they'd been involved in, that was a big part of what made someone really valuable when sitting on a board so they could comment on a very wide range of, of aspects that we needed to cover. Yeah, I'm going to wrap up with a five-question quickfire. So the one book that you think every board member should read? That's a tough one. If every board member has done what I've done over Christmas and lockdown, I would recommend Michael Mosley's The Fast 800 Keto Diet Book to get fit and healthy as we go into 2022. That's what I'm currently looking at and, uh, and I'm on. In terms of leadership books, as I say, I quite like the Sean Covey book around the, the principles of execution. I'm sure there are amazing leadership books out there. The Nike book is great, but I think board members know what they like reading. Get fit. That's what I would say. Your favorite quote? My favorite quote is the one I, give, I gave my kids as they grew up and which I learned to love, which is love what you do and do what you love. I like people with passion. They're energized by what they do. And that's, that's something I think if you can live by that, you've got it made. It's not very insightful business-wise, but as a life philosophy, I love it. And your favorite holiday? Well, when I retired from Microsoft, I set myself a number of challenges, one of which was to learn to sail. So I became, I got my skipper's certificate. So the last few years, I've been sailing around different parts of Europe with one of my friends and his family. And so catamaraning around Croatia last year was amazing. So at the moment, that's my favorite pastime on holiday. Sounds brilliant. And, and your favorite app? It's probably WhatsApp for the only reason that it's the only way my youngest daughter ever talks to me. 
So the only way I can get a hold of her is via WhatsApp. And so at the moment, that's my favorite app. It's my lifeline to talking to my kids. And finally, your best financial investment idea for 2022. I don't give financial investment advice. Be careful is my best advice. I think, you know, it's going to be a tricky year this year with interest rates where they are. I think markets will be very jittery. So be careful would be my financial advice. I'm certainly looking at things in a cautious way personally. Brilliant. Neil, thank you so much for taking the time. You know, I've always been amazed by how Microsoft has grown. And when I meet someone like you, it's no wonder when they have obviously such brilliant talent at work. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights. It's been great chatting to you. Oh, my pleasure. Great talking to you, Oliver.